Hello everyone and welcome to our Climate Action Digest, a Race Against Time webinar. I'm Athena van der Gauw, I'm the Europe Operations Specialist at Southpol and I'm hosting today's webinar. I would first like to thank everyone for making the time to join us today. I welcome you from London with my colleagues and our expert speakers in Zurich. But before we begin, and while a few more people are signing in, let me just introduce you to a few housekeeping rules. As attendees, you are all on mute now. But if you have a comment or question, please raise your hand with the little hand symbol on your control panel or use the chat function. If you have a technical difficulty and general questions, please contact us directly. For any content related questions, we would like to invite you to refer to Q&A at the end of this webinar. Please feel free to type your questions in the designated box in the webinar panel. Before starting, I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers today. The webinar will be moderated by Renat Heuberger, our CEO and pioneer and social entrepreneur in the field of sustainability, climate change and renewable energies, where he's been engaged since 1999. He's joined by our two main speakers, Jeff Swartz, our Director of Climate Policy and Carbon Markets. Jeff is an international recognized climate change and carbon pricing expert with experience across the UK, the EU, the US and China. Francisca Stinner, Head of Advisory for Corporates and Capital Markets. Francisca is a subject matter professional in climate change risk assessments and risk management systems. During this webinar, we will give you a snapshot of the current climate action landscape, big trends in climate policy and carbon pricing and risk and opportunities for corporate players. We will then wrap up with a future outlook and a 15 minute Q&A. Now I'm handing over to Renat. Good afternoon and good morning also from my side. Uh, thanks for joining this webinar. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to an exciting and challenging year 2019, where unfortunately we are about to set two new records, one record is around global emissions. We are about to have highest emissions ever seen in this year. And the second record is also on global temperature, which is projected to be highest than ever before. But in this webinar, we will uh, convince you, or at least we will try to convince you, that even though it's a challenging year, it is also a year of hope and a year of solutions and a year of climate action. And I hope at the end of this webinar, you will all be convinced that it's well worth to engage in this race. And this fight against climate change is an exciting fight. We can win it and winning it will be beneficial for many of us. Let me set the stage a little bit. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, unfortunately, it looks like in 2018, studies show that again, they have been increasing. You can see here that in particular in India and China, emissions have been on the increase again. And the only uh, bigger block where emissions have been decreasing is the European Union. You can also see on my next slide here that we are starting to feel climate change in our pockets, in our wallets. This is a slide by Munich Green, which shows you the insured natural, uh, natural catast catastrophe claims, which hit an astonishing 135 billion US dollars in 2017. The average was at around 49 billion, so we are well above average of these claims. However, these figures are only the insured claims. So that's the amount of money insurance companies had to pay for covering the natural damages. Statistics show that at no more than half of global damage is actually insured. So you can guess yourself, where do you think are all the other damages happening? It's unfortunately in emerging markets, in poor countries, which don't have the means to buy insurance coverage. And for those people which are living in uninsured uh, or in areas with less insurance coverage, of course, the damage is felt right away in their wallet. By the way, on this slide, you can also see what kind of damages have been increasing. 
It's actually at this point mostly hydrological damages, which is floods, um, on, highly on the increase in the past couple of years. However, also in the last year, and actually also even this year in January, already we have seen calls for climate action, luckily are now louder and louder. We have more and more mainstream media, mainstream companies, which echo the strong urge, the strong push to get really active. We had Greta, even here in Switzerland, Davos, telling global leaders that she wants them to panic around climate change. So here on this slide, you find just a few um, of the uh, of recent uh, statements we had. So I believe more and more, at least we start talking the talk. The question is, are we also walking the walk as well as talking the talk? And on, the, on this slide, you can see, this is just an example. This next slide here shows you the number of companies that have joined the RE100 initiative. What is RE100? RE100 stands for Renewable Energy 100. So these are global corporates who have committed globally to purchase only renewable energy. And you can see over the past years, the amount of companies has been steadily increasing. Um, I could show you similar slides on other topics such as uh, zero deforestation claims, science-based targets, other types of um, uh, target setting companies do. At this point, nearly all companies with, of any of uh, sizable companies, FT500 or take any other uh, index, have some kind of environmental targets in place. So I would say the race is on. The big question is, are we fast enough? Every month matters. Every month that we are advancing climate action is a good month. Every fraction of a degree matters. Every fraction of a degree we can lower the heat is a good fraction of a degree. I think it's really worth fighting this fight. The question is, uh, once again, are we still able to move fast enough so that we can find the damage? So in this sense, talking about the race, now we want to find out whether at least the direction of travel of this race is the right one. And for this topic, I would like to now invite my colleague, Jeff Swartz, our head of climate policy and carbon markets, to give you some outlook on what is currently happening on the policy side. Well, thank you very much, Reynard, and uh, good day to all of you. So we had a tremendous success last year year with the sign-off of the Paris rulebook in Katowice in Poland. And many of us are now wondering, well, what happens next? And in South Pole, our thinking and our beliefs and our goals really is that now it's time for the private sector and non-state actors to really step up and start delivering on the commitments that were set in the NDCs and the commitments that were set in the Paris Agreement. Now, many of you might not have read the rule book itself, but I think there are four things that we really need to keep in mind when we talk about Paris. The first is Paris is in place and now it's time for countries to ramp up the action that they're going to take in order to make sure that the temperature goals of uh, two degrees are well below two degrees and ultimately one and a half degrees are met with their national climate policies and their nationally determined contributions. So the rule book is far from perfect and many countries know that already, but it's up to national governments, subnational governments and municipalities to start developing new policies that take meaningful action on climate change. So NDCs are the name of the game, and it's up to all of us to make sure that countries meet the commitments that they set forth in those NDCs. The second key element for the Paris Agreement in the rulebook for us to follow is Article 6. Now, Article 6 is all about how countries can cooperate on climate change in order to increase the ambition of their NDCs and in order to meaningfully cooperate with uh, carbon markets. 
Unfortunately, Article 6 uh, was the one part of the rule book in Katowice, which there was no agreement on, but it will be the main focus of the upcoming COP in Chile in January next year. And now is the time really to start exploring how Article 6 works. In South Pole, we're developing two of the first pilots around Article 6 in the entire world. One will be in Thailand in the e-mobility sector, and the other will be in Colombia with the renewable energy sector. And we cannot wait to start sharing with you the results of this interesting pioneering and piloting work that we're doing with Article 6. The third element is the Green Climate Fund. We know that in order to finance the action that is necessary to get us on the two degree and one and a half degree pathway, we need meaningful climate action that is financed by both the public and the private sector. And the Green Climate Fund really needs to start uh, walking the walk and talking the talk as Reynat was describing in his slide just a moment ago. We need this money to unlock private capital that can start getting into the hands of those that need it as quickly as possible in order to combat climate change. So we're looking forward to seeing uh, meaningful action and reform at the Green Climate Fund so that it can start playing an even bigger role towards financing international climate change than it already is doing. And the fourth point, and, and many would say this is actually the most important point, is voluntary action by non-state actors. And that means all of us who are not uh, working for a public institution. Although there's no direct link to the Paris Agreement in the rule book of how voluntary action will fulfill the ultimate uh, goals of, of the agreement itself, we know that we have to take action. We know that we cannot rely on governments themselves in order to deliver all of the action that's needed. And so we're working with many interesting clients those could be corporates, those could be investors, their NGOs, their foundations, their cities, uh, their development banks. All of them are looking for solutions. And this is the key uh, USP that South Pole provides in this world that we're dealing with when it comes to climate change. So for us, voluntary action by non-state actors is the key thing to, to look forward to uh, going forward now that we have the rule book uh, agreed on. Real action, though, is still a long way off. This uh, slide shows you the countries that have uh, really put in place uh, good NDCs. This is from Climate Action Tracker, which I know many of you have been on their website uh, from time to time. There's very few countries which are actual role models for putting forward meaningful NDCs. And fortunately, most countries are not putting forward the targets that they need to in order for us to get towards the two degree and one and a half degree pathway. But that doesn't mean that we might see sudden action in the months and years to come. There are surprising developments at every turn. For example, one country in South America, Colombia, which we're working very actively in, created a carbon tax just two years ago. And that happened within a very short period of time. And now this carbon tax is one of the main ways that Colombia is going to deliver the finance that is needed in order for it to meet its NDC. There are other countries which might have political changes in the months and years to come where more meaningful action might occur. One country that we're following very closely is Australia. Australia, as you might have seen in the news just in the last few days, is, is suffering greatly from climate change. There's tremendous heat waves and droughts there. And we're looking forward to what might change in Australia on the political level in order for Australia to set forward more meaningful emission reduction targets. Countries aren't the only ones who need to prepare for uh, the two degree target or the one and a half degree target businesses will have to prepare as well. They can either prepare by getting ready for meaningful compliance uh, uh, policies that will come uh, very quickly, or they can engage governments di directly and propose solutions on how these NDCs will be defined and financed. One example of that is in uh, Ghana. And in Ghana, we're working very closely with the cocoa sector, who is trying to help the Ghanaian government further define how we can tackle deforestation and have more resilient and climate smart agriculture. And this is why it's so important 
that the private sector pays attention to policy developments at the national level. And ultimately, we're all going to have to get smarter and more focused on how we address climate change at the national and subnational level. We're leading private and public cooperation globally. And these are just a few examples of, of projects that we've recently begun that we're very proud to share. We are, in addition to the work we're doing in Ghana and the cocoa sector, we're developing two Article 6 pilots, one in Thailand, one in Colombia. We're very eager to share results of this with you later this year. We have a, a tremendously interesting opportunity in India where we're identifying ways for India to develop its, its city and urban landscapes in a much more climate friendly way. We've identified uh, low carbon roadmaps for the electricity sector in Egypt, and we're working with the German government in the rollout of its NACAG initiative, which is all about getting countries to start financing directly technologies that phase out HFC 23 emissions from 2020 onwards. One of the most interesting mandates that I'm really excited about is in Costa Rica, as this one's all about coffee. And I'm sure many of you are interested in having a good cup of coffee right after lunch in Europe. And we're some, doing some very interesting work in Costa Rica by helping them develop the very first carbon neutral coffee industry across the whole country the government of Costa Rica has hired South Pole to develop uh, solutions on how it can uh, create an entire carbon neutral industry for its coffee sector, one of the leading exports of, of the country of Costa Rica. Looking forward, our company is very much focused on the future of meaningful projects that can help uh, countries and companies directly reduce emissions. Our DNA is in the verification and delivery of meaningful emissions reductions. Our portfolio of carbon re reduction projects is growing. We are looking at projects in the land use sector and in the sectors where we can have a real impact on the ground with communities. We link this directly to the, the pioneering solutions we've developed in the monitoring, reporting and verification space. And we're very much looking forward to working with uh, companies, governments, and individuals on how we can further develop meaningful emissions reductions projects on the ground uh, going forward. One area of interesting work that uh, we've started to think about, and, and I hope we can have another webinar just on this subject in the near future, is climate positivity. We're interested in talking to others about how we can go beyond what's required, how we can become climate positive enterprises and deliver beyond emissions reductions that go beyond just carbon neutrality. This is a very new way of thinking. And what it's all about is picking up on the lack of ambition that we might see from other entities and compensating that on our own. So we become positive forces in the world for climate change, not just neutral forces. And finally, we're looking very much into more meaningful ways of results-based finance. One really interesting example of this work is something we've done with Climate Kick, where we are uh, leading efforts across Europe on how we can finance initiatives in cities in Europe to deliver and prove meaningful action and on cities and climate change activities on the ground throughout European cities. And we're very proud of that work that we've done with Climate Kick. So I'm going to hand the, the slides now over to our colleague, Francisca Sinner, who's going to talk to you in more detail about how companies can achieve the results needed in order to fulfill the ultimate goals of the Paris Agreement. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Um, before handing to Francesca, just one uh, thought. If you have questions to Jeff, please think about them now and put them into the chat because we will take questions at the end of both presentations. So same for Francisca's presentation. Uh, think about your questions, put them in the chat so we can, our moderation team can uh, basically uh, compile them and we will have a good Q&A session in a minute. Now, Francisca, please. Thank you, Renat. Thank you, Jeff, for setting the stage. 
Action is needed. You said it, Jeff, not only the public sector. Now it's really on the private sector. So what I want to do in the next couple of minutes is really focus on the corporate sector and see a, what we have been seeing in trends and good activities and um, innovative um, ideas there, as well as um, looking a little bit ahead um, and, and maybe showing where we should all go to or move towards to. But let me start with looking back first. Three major trends we discovered during the year 2018, very much um, in parallel with the with the climate policy uh, debate and and topics appearing there. First of all, SDGs is still a topic for corporates to mainly summarize impacts, assess impacts, but also use the framework to set targets and um, communicate your impacts and targets. Um, the framework is ideal because it's very broad. It covers a lot. And um, that's why a lot of uh, corporates are trying to use it. However, it also um, has a challenge because it is so broad and it's not originally targeted for the private sector. Um, a lot of challenges arise when, um, when you really want to quantify positive and negative impact because sometimes it's just not specific enough and it doesn't tell you step by step how to quantify. Still, we see um, that it's a good framework. There is topics uh, or where topics arising um, uh, among uh, those 17 goals in the year 2018, uh, which haven't been discussed as much the years before. One example is biodiversity. It's coming up more and more plastics, single-use plastics. Companies are trying to eliminate that, link that into the circular economy discussion. So there's always within those goals, although they pretty broad, there's always some upcoming topics. Um, uh, also, I think what got clear is that quantification and impact assessment question is really um, uh, dominating um, because corporates got, or um, it became clear that you need a solid data basis for setting ambitious targets. And the example is SBTs. A lot of companies went that road and tried to develop SBTs, and it's only possible and it's a necessity to have a good robust data system and a scope three um, accounting and quantification as a basis before you can even go into ambitious targets. So that's an example. Um, and that's also a little bit um, what what the two th year 2018 showed in the corporate world, really um, getting the heads around how can we quantify scope three, et cetera. The SPTs, of course, lead to the second focus Companies are trying to anchor their goals and targets um, towards the Paris Agreement, towards the two degree or 1.5 degree pathway. But it's not only with SPTs, it's one example, but there's also such, uh, there's also RE100, such as Reina mentioned, and there's other initiatives. There's the Article 6 initiatives, of course, everything what um, Jeff said. But there's even more in the discussions. There's the topic of just transition, even in the corporate world. There is the topic of adaptive capacities, resilience. So that all links a little bit with the policy development, but it, it's also topics which are discussed by corporates. Last but not least, um, we, we saw a big trend in the financial sector environment that clients want to align their portfolios with something like two degrees or the Paris goal. So um, that as well leads me to the last um, big topic we saw in 2018, the task force for climate related financial disclosure. Um, there was a lot of hype around it in 2018 and some clients almost said, oh, I'm fed up, I can't hear it anymore. But to be honest, what it did is it really pushed the discussion into a risk perspective. And and yes, if if people think that was too much, that can be for individuals, but um, it really moved us forward to think not only about impacts and target setting, but really about thinking, how can we integrate climate risks into our day-to-day -day business operations into our strategy and into um, our financial disclosure. And that was also the aim of the TCFD. 
Um, they raised the discussion of physical risks, which really got a push last year. They also um, uh, recommended to look at risks with the help of scenarios, so that got a push. Um, so all in all, I think these three key trends, they really link and interact with each other. Um, they are along the, the policy uh, discussion, but this is really what dominated the, the year 2018 in the corporate world. Um, I wanted to continue and focus a little bit more on that risk discussion because we get a, uh, a lot of clients approach us and want to discuss on the transitional and physical risk uh, with us, this is mainly because they they also face challenges, and the challenges on this is not only the usual ones um, of data availability, complexity, and non consistency. It's it's more. I think what becomes clear is when you're discussing risks, you need to look at scenarios. So clients approach us: How do we make these scenarios useful for us? How can we really you? use the results of a risk assessment, how can we integrate it uh, into our decision making, how can we deal with adaptive capacities um, of companies and corporates, um, and how can we identify and quantify opportunities. Um, so all these complex questions come up when, when we discuss transitional and physical risk assessments. Um, the biggest lessons learned I, I had when working with clients that these risk assessments, although a lot of people ask for it, they can hardly be standardized. And I hear a lot of people saying, oh, we need better data and more standardized approaches, and then we, we are fine. But to be honest, my lessons learned with the clients is the risk assessment can be done in a high level, in a standard way. You can screen for you, the first uh, high-level risks and and define uh, priorities, but then it becomes really, really bespoke, and you need to look into hotspots, and those are very situational. They are very dependent on business models, so they, they differ a lot from client to client. Um, however, that said, there is a lot of good tools and things and resources out there. Um, there is a very good case um, study examples by the PRI. They always publish uh, companies when they do something uh, good. So it's a lot of uh, good learning there. The uh, UNFFI is um, publishing guidances. There is uh, free tools, for example, from the Two Degree Initiative. So there is a lot of support. But to be honest, I think it's a little bit unrealistic to believe, oh, we will get one standard out there which tells us how to do the risk assessment and it will all solve our problem. Um, yeah. Now I wanted to show two more specific examples of good risk management and risk um, assessment practices we saw last year with our clients. And one example is from the corporate um, sector. And then the second example will be the financial sector example. And this one is a good example from a client of ours from the consumer goods industry or sector. They have a vertically integrated supply chain um, uh, based on an agricultural commodity, and they are active in 27 countries globally. So what they really did is they combined, uh, I would say, a top-down and a bottom-up approach. Um, so they started top-down and assessed high-level risks of all their operations, um, of all their um, activities, and then they narrowed down. They narrowed down from a risk perspective. So they basically said, we take the highest risks first. And then they really went bottom up at the same time. So they went locally and tried to identify local actions to mitigate those risks. So that's why it's a combined approach. They define strategies and targets um, for the high risk areas. And then when they were done with those, they went with the medium risk areas. So very simple, but step-by-step -step approach. The good thing of this is um, they now in, in, a, in a, a lot of locations, they yeah, now implement projects and they really generate a difference and they make a change. They have a zero deforestation goal. 
Um, they have a, a very targeted water um, consumption goals. So out of those risk assessments, they defined um, very ambitious targets. And the highest ambition, I think, is even uh, in that fact that they want to get third party verified and everything. And I think that was also a, a big lessons learned here that by taking the risk approach in all of this, the assurance at the end and the third party audit is is actually pretty easy or or it's nice and relatively simply to implement because an auditor also always comes with a risk perspective. So it, it was easy for us to explain why we did certain things um, and the auditor can could could really relate to it. So that was a, a very good um, uh, co-benefit of this. The second example, sorry, second example I want to give is from the financial sector. Um, a client, uh, actually a, a pension fund, approached us and wanted to, in long term, get two degree aligned. They are right now at this um, uh, at this moment where they try to move from the phase understanding, where they really try to understand what is my investment portfolio and where is my climate impact, to how can I integrate climate risks and the climate perspective in my decision making. Um, so they're really in the middle of the blue and the yellow uh, phase here. Um, they approached us for that. They wanted to learn how risk metrics and um, uh, data on uh, transitional and physical risks can help them to make more informed decisions on their investment portfolio. They were starting with carbon footprint a longer time ago. Um, they said it, it's kind of limited. It didn't really give them a risk perspective. So we looked into risk data with them, we try to analyze the portfolio um, and their risk, uh, um, uh, their risks along uh, uh, a geographical uh, spread. Uh, we looked at the different sectors they were invested in and the sectoral uh, uh, risks, and we try to use this um, or apply this in different scenarios and really try to make. Um, the data uh, useful for them in order to optimize their portfolio, maybe changing sector weights, go into individual titles, use the results for engagements and really explore how they can work with the results and how they can actually optimize their portfolio. So these two examples um, were just some, some really interesting ones, uh, which uh, we came across during the last year to summarize a little bit. I mean, no question, we all aware um, uh, we need to not only proactively um, manage consequences of climate change now, we need more. If we're thinking of the current impacts, assuming they can only worsen in almost all scenarios we could be in, um, we need more by the corporate sector than only um, only adaptational or adjustment changes. We really need transformational and innovative change. Um, we saw a couple of examples here. Jeff mentioned some examples. Change, yeah, requires leadership. And leadership is something which means you need to step out of business as usual. You need to get out of the status quo. You need to do something different. It doesn't need to be very fancy and very big, such as the Googles do. It can be something really small. It can be you are having a strength and you focus on one topic and you, you move that forward. It can be that you um, are transparent and you share your experiences and your challenges with others. So moving information in the public domain is also leadership. And it can be that you collaborate more with other stakeholders and um, such as Jeff said, um, look into the, the public sector, work with the public sector and um, try to reach a change. I'm leaving it here from the corporate sector side, handing over to Rena, who does look into the year 2019 at a more high level. Many thanks, uh, Francisca. This already brings us to the last slide of this webinar. And before 
opening to Q&A. Once again, the reminder, please type your questions into the chat now so we can get started in Q&A very soon. While you're doing that, here are, here's a selection of uh, five topics that we believe you should watch out in 2019. First, as many of you know, many companies took environmental commitments 2020. Why 2020? Because it's a round number. So many companies back in 2013, 14, pledged X, Y, Z uh, by 2020. We're going to reduce emissions uh, by 2020. We're going to go renewable. Now, the clock is ticking. We are approaching 2020 quite soon. So it's time to perform. So expect enhanced corporate climate action in the run-up to 2020. Second topic, aviation and shipping. Aviation and shipping have been two big, big sectors, big sources of emissions, which have been carved out of political agreements, most importantly, the Kyoto Protocol. The question, but the time is changing. As we all know, in aviation, we have a, a big mechanism being scheduled and uh, also on shipping, there are talks about uh, regulation. So the question is, for this year, will kind of pre-compliance start in those sectors in spite of the delay of this market mechanism? Uh, this is another topic to watch out. Third big topic for us, Jeff mentioned it before, the Paris Agreement, Article 6, most importantly, 6.2 and 6.4. Those are the articles which should regulate the international cooperation of climate mitigation. And as Jeff has explained, the rules are not there yet on that. That has been the carve out in the COP in Poland. The question is, will that succeed at the next conference of the parties, which will happen in Chile? Uh, that's uh, the next topic to watch out. New regional compliance schemes. In addition to global efforts, as we all know, Paris is uh, urging countries to take action. So a lot of countries are currently setting up their answer to Paris, their uh, NDCs. And the question is, will that lead to new uh, regional color, um, country level compliance schemes? For example, in China, in Australia, with the new elections coming up, again, by the way, uh, Australian elections, uh, as usual in Australia, climate change will be a big topic in the election. Or Mexico under its new presidency. And perhaps last but not least, uh, a point which um, has become very relevant just over the past couple of weeks, civil society. More or less out of the blue, we had Greta Thunberg's movement of which you certainly all have heard. Um, the strike where students and pupils stayed out of school and started protesting climate, against climate change. This is for, for us as a long-standing climate company, a very interesting moment because in spite of us and many other players providing solutions since quite a while, the civil society movement has not been very active over the past couple of years. Perhaps with the exception of climate marches that happened in New York, in San Francisco, and other places, it hasn't been a very active movement. Now, Greta Thunberg is putting this upside down, where all of a sudden uh, leaders have to answer the question, why are you not panicking? The question is, of course, will that movement continue? Will it go viral? Will it actually lead to protests, let me say, similar in scale? Uh, like we have seen protests, for example, in France with the total opposites uh, achievement. I think comparing Greta's movement and the uh, Gilles Jean movement in France also brings us back to my point in the very beginning with which I would like to end this webinar. Um, the race is on. Which part of the civil society is going to be stronger? Is it people protesting against climate action in, uh, because uh, because some elements of climate action, for example, uh, fuel prices, are the dominant argument, or will the civil society part follow Greta? 
which is a movement that says, you know, we have to leapfrog, we have to get real with climate action. The race is on. 2019 will be a very exciting year. I hope that Francisca and Jeff were able to convey you some of the topics and some of the solutions we have. As usual, South Pole and our team are anytime more than willing to answer your questions more in detail. But for now, I would like to hand back to Nadia and the moderation team to take a few questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Renat, uh, Jeff and Francisca for those great presentations. We've got a great deal of questions coming through, uh, so we're going to move on to the Q&A session. We're going to start off with some questions for Jeff. First question we have here is, what is the single strongest tool that governments have when, when facilitating private investments? Is it through multilateral forums? Oh, okay, great. Let's <clears throat> let's take that uh, right away. Uh, excellent question. Um, you know, we've seen a tremendous amount of international climate finance being channeled from development banks um, and from um, the accounts of, of, of European countries or, or North American or Antibodean governments go towards the global south towards uh, addressing climate change. And a lot of this, whether the money is, is focused on forestry, whether it's focused on agriculture, whether it's focused on renewable energy, has all been um, spent uh, in the goodwill that uh, uh, those reductions would uh, be achieved and that uh, countries would start scaling up uh, meaningful policies of their own. One of the most uh, uh, important tools that I'm aware of that really gets countries the finance that they need quickly and gets them on the pathway to meaningfully deliver emissions reductions is through uh, the World Bank's the Partnership for Market Readiness. Now, this is an initiative which is a grant-based initiative that's been around since 2013. Governments receive a grant from the World Bank and in return of this grant, they use it towards uh, setting up uh, ways that they can put in place a carbon pricing policy uh, in, in the near future. Now, I think this is a more meaningful way of spending money, public sector money, than um, simple grants. It's, it's got strings attached to it. And the German government um, NACG initiative was similar to that. It says, well, we'll give you money to pay for the uh, depletion of uh, HFC and, and N2O uh, reductions now, but you need to pay for it uh, going forward. And I think these are very strong tools uh, from the eyes of uh, the, the funders, but also in the eyes of uh, the, the users of this finance, it gets them on a, a pathway towards setting it in place uh, meaningful policies that put a price on carbon and start delivering emissions reductions. The other tool that I think is something that Francisca really mentioned, um, but wasn't really discussed at large in our presentation uh, to date, is around how corporates can scale up voluntary action in countries. So one of the really interesting success stories of the last year was Colombia, which has a carbon tax. They've set a carbon tax to address uh, emissions from their energy sector. And uh, companies, uh, whether you're a Colombian company or a multinational company, you can uh, buy and use voluntary emissions reductions uh, units in order to uh, compensate for that ta tax in Colombia. I think this has been a, a tremendous success for Colombia. They're reducing their emissions. They have money in the, in the bank that they can use towards uh, addressing uh, biodiversity protection that they can use towards increasing uh, the, the share of forestry in the country and that they can use towards a, the peace and reconciliation that Colombia desperately needs after many years of, of conflict. So I would say it's public sector money that gets countries on the pathway towards meaningful carbon pricing policies. And I would say it's also voluntary action by companies in countries that they can use in lieu of of paying for those carbon prices themselves. And Colombia is an interesting example that other countries could explore. Thank you, Athena. 
Thank you very much. We have another related question here. Um, in a few sentences, how can companies or non-state actors best engage with the Paris Agreement? Well, in a few sentences is, is a tall order, but uh, we've seen a tremendous amount of commitments that uh, companies have set in the last few years and that are continuing to set either through by setting a science-based target, by setting uh, a renewable energy target to move towards 100% renewable energy, by setting a deforestation target so that they uh, have a clean supply chain that does not uh, destroy uh, any, any source of, of forestry, or by setting an internal carbon price so that all of their future investments will be subject to a voluntary and internal carbon price. Now, none of these initiatives will be uh, addressed uh, uh, officially under the Paris Agreement, but they're all initiatives that companies should be proud to display, that companies should be proud to have when they walk into a room and meet with uh, officials from governments, that they should be proud to display on their products and that they should be proud to talk about in meaningful forums on the margins of uh, conferences that take place to address uh, the Paris Agreement. So I believe that these uh, sector-wide commitments are something that need to continue to, to operate and that could be further refreshed from time to time. Um, Science-based targets are on the march, but they are not an, uh, a be-all to the end-all. Companies, depending on their sector, also need to set uh, uh, sector-specific goals and, and, and policies so that they are calculating as an industry how many emissions reductions they are achieving. And therefore, those emissions reductions should be widely communicated uh, to governments and, and should be recorded when governments uh, uh, calculate their, their nationally determined contributions uh, towards the Paris Agreement. One policy detail that I think often gets overlooked is that the nationally determined contributions that government set are going to be running for the next 10 years, but it's only in 2025 or in 2030 when governments achieve those targets, when they show how they met those targets, is when governments will be looking at what corporates did during that period by setting in place science-based targets or by setting in place 100% uh, renewable energy targets. So don't expect that just because governments have set their NDCs now and that the, the commitment doesn't take place until 2025 or 2030, that the governments will be looking towards corporates about how they achieve those targets in, in 2025 or 2030. I believe that companies uh, should be prepared for having very serious conversations with governments in the next year and years to come to show how they are going to help governments meet those NBCs. So although these are voluntary commitments that corporates are setting, there are also commitments that governments will be looking for about how they can use them towards calculating their overall countrywide emissions reductions target. So now is the time to act. Perhaps if I may add one small point here, we have in this presentation talked a lot about climate risks, but of course there is also climate opportunities out there. And as Jeff just said, while governments are now busy getting real with their NDCs and think about concrete policy measures, one way or the other, many sectors in many countries will be subject to some form of carbon pricing. This means that if you are involved as a corporate in any sector, such as clean technology, um, such as, uh, such as uh, efficient building uh, home optimization, any kind of technology which will benefit from rising carbon prices, then one way of aligning with Paris is also to be very, um, to, to watch out for new policies that are coming up that might uh, move the needle towards your business solution. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have a question here for Francisca as well. What are the risk assessment tools that you could recommend to investors? 
There is a couple of tools out there. Mostly they are not free of charge. There's only the main two degree investment initiative tool out there, which you can use. Um, Southpool has its own tool. Uh, it's hard to say per se, there is one tool which is better than all the others. Um, I think they are all strong. Um, I think you need to decide what you want to look at, if more on the transitional risk side or more the physical risk side, because the tools really um, differ there. And then I think you need, you sh what I would usually recommend is approach the different providers, um, understand what those tools can offer you, and really define your own expectations and define what do you want to do with the results of the tool. And that's maybe also why I'm saying there is not the one tool out there. Um, I think they all good depending on what you really want to do. And uh, as I said, it's, it's an iterative <coughs> process. It's really working with the results. There will not be a a just a standard output of a tool which you can integrate in your standard ESG data set and, and you're done. I think you have to work with the results. You have to see how you really make them useful for yourself and, and for the purpose either of, uh, you know, make uh, adjusting your investment portfolio, maybe just for internal strategy discussions, maybe for stock picking. I wouldn't recommend it. But so so you really need to define the purpose first and what do you want to do with the results and then go out there and, and, and see what the best tool and the best service around it, uh, is there. Thank you for that. Um, a related question. Uh, what are the climate risks that are most that are most commonly overlooked by portfolio man managers? Sorry, excuse me. I didn't understand the beginning of the question. Um, sorry. So the question is, what are the climate risks that are most commonly overlooked by portfolio managers? Overlooked. Overlooked, yes. Yeah. Um, Difficult question. Um, I think I think the transitional risks are usually better assessed by portfolio managers so far, what I see out there. Physical risks are more a question mark. So they are maybe not overlooked, but they are more difficult to grasp. They are more difficult because they have complex data sets uh, behind them. They are more more difficult to to make them tangible and to make them um, explicit, um, but there is not the one risk which which I would say is overlooked. Perhaps to, to add one point here, uh, what we see increasingly is that not risks are overlooked. People are quite uh, uh, comprehensive in in their way, but I think there are two there. Two topics that uh, that are important. One is that uh, I call this is binary risks. Many people, when they talk about risks, they have linear scales in mind. They think that, well, with the uh, one fraction of a degree warming, I have one fraction of a degree more risks. But unfortunately, climate change doesn't work like that. In many places, in many geographies, we have binary risks um, beyond a certain tipping point. A risk can completely spin out of control. Uh, you have had this case, for example, in uh, in California uh, last end of last year with the uh, with the forest fires, where you know the, the damage that was caused by the forest fires led to the immediate bankruptcy of the largest Californian utility. Uh, so the risk was not you know one more forest fire means one additional degree of risk, but it actually mean, meant bankruptcy of the whole utility with all the consequences that that you have as a taxpayer now. Um, another risk that is sometimes overlooked and also in the bi binary league is litigation risks. Um, we have seen with tobacco, for example, that the litigation cases against uh, this harm caused by tobacco smoke was uh, a, or continues to be a real issue for the entire industry. Um, in climate change, we have we are seeing currently uh, a first wave of uh, cases. For example, the, the government of New York 
is suing large companies for the consequences of, of the hurricanes. And those litigation risks are very difficult to quantify. If they happen, they can be very big. Um, so I would add those two points, like the, the fact that we have litigation risks as well, and the other fact that we have non linear risks in climate change that make it so difficult for portfolio manager to really have a, a full overview on what's going on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have one more last question here for you, Francisca. It's more impact related. Um, could you tell us more about your framework to access SDGs that you use with your clients when you are assessing SDGs? Our framework is A, based on both positive and negative impacts. I think that's very important. So we don't only want to tell the good story. Uh, we really want to be holistic. We usually pick the most material SDGs. So we're not looking at everything at the same time and this, uh, in the same level of effort, but we'll sit down, try to understand from a business uh, and operational point of view, where is the material impact of the business, um, focus on those SDGs, try to then quantify both the negative and the positive impacts, and then also try to, at the same time, identify mitigation options of those uh, impacts. I think that's the high-level approach and framework, how we go about it. Again, with SDGs, I would also say it, it's dependent on what the main goal of a corporate is, why what do you want with the SDGs? Is it a purely communicational approach? So do you want to tell a good story? Or do you really want to integrate the SDGs into your, your um, strategic decisions? And could you, for example, imagine to define KPIs along the SD, SDGs, which, um, which are used by the high level management and which are applied in, in more business related decisions. So depending on, on what you want and where you wanna go, we'll also adjust the framework or the approach we use. Thank you very much, Francisca. That will be the last question for the Q&A. Um, I will want to thank you very much for attending our webinar today. Uh, we will be sharing this recording with you within the next week and we will get back to you with the remaining questions individually. In case you have any further questions in the meantime, please do not hesitate to reach out to us at events at southpole.com. Thank you very much again and I hope to see you soon. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you.